My name is Bud Hedeke, and uh, I flew with the 452nd Bomb Group, 730th Squadron of the Mighty 8th Air Force, stationed in England. I flew 23 combat missions and three mercy missions, which were food drops to the people of Holland. We were uh, shot down on our first mission, but I believe I can go into that a little more later. I uh, grew up on the northwest side of Chicago, Illinois. And in fact, uh, I was in a mall shop on December 7, 1941. I was a 16-year-old kid with a buddy of mine sitting there sucking on a malt. And over the radio, Franklin Delano Roosevelt mentioned that the Japanese Empire had attacked America. And I remember so well saying to my buddy, boy, we'll never get in were too young. And those two years went by very fast. But as a kid in Chicago, my dad was a printer for 40 years. I lived in a three flat. We didn't have a lot, but we were millionaires because we had love and we had a wonderful family. And I grew up uh, under a fairly strict father and mother, but mother was very compassionate as most mothers are. But uh, I was drafted in 1943, fresh out of high school. I remember so well coming home from high school and walking down, we called it the airway or the gangway of our house, and heard my subtle mother humming, da 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 And I thought, oh boy, my draft notice is here. And it was. And the funny thing about it is my dad would not let me enlist. And everybody at that time, and that's very hard for people today to realize, everybody wanted to go in. Everybody wanted to defend their country. As I said to many when, um, what was her name, Kate Smith sang God Bless America, everybody sang it with her and meant it. But my dad wouldn't let me as most fathers don't want their kids, as I didn't want my son to enlist in Vietnam, but he eventually went. Nevertheless, I was drafted and I was in camp July 19th. If I would have been uh, deferred, or as, my, as I said, my father wouldn't let me enlist, I wouldn't have gone in until September. But that's the way the cookie crumbled. Uh, I went in the service on July 19th, 1943, and I got out in uh, October 30th, 1945. Uh, I went in, as I said, uh, to the draft board on uh, Montrose Avenue in Chicago. I remember it so well. We stood in line and they had a rubber stamp and they stamped me Navy. And I said, I don't want Navy, and I'm not afraid of water. I love to swim. And the guy said, go ahead, go by. We need Navy. I said, I don't want Navy. He said, okay, and he grabbed another stamp and stamped me Army. And then they sent me to Camp Grant, Rockford, Illinois. And if I remember, maybe not exactly, we all sat in this big room, and some major colonel or somebody came out and said, are there anyone interested in going into the Air Force? And a number of us held our hands up. And then we were uh, ushered into another room and we were given a battery of tests, not to see if we were MIT graduates, but just to see if we had, I guess, what they were looking for. And that's how I got into the Air Force. And then from there I was sent to Jefferson Barracks, Missouri for cadet basic and that was a pilot basic. And I passed the physical, I think it was called a 64, and uh, so forth and so on. And we also went through all the basic training stuff that you had to go through. But unfortunately, in the service, like in life, they had quotas. And all of a sudden, they didn't need any more pilots. They needed bomb crew members. And so I ended up training to be a bomb crew member. And uh, I can't remember all the camps uh, sitting here like this. I have a list of them. I know I went to Kingman, Arizona for uh, 
air-to-ground gunnery where we had to fire at targets and so forth. And every now and then we'd come in and some guy said, I got myself a coyote today. I mean, a coyote running in the field. And uh, it's a joke. And uh, I also trained at Lowry Field, Denver, Colorado, Armament School. I went to Bigsfield, El Paso, Texas, where we did a lot of practice missions. And uh, we had to do a lot. And I do remember this, a lot of B-24s going into the so-called mountains, which were small hills, uh, but actually crashing in El Paso, Texas. And that was kind of a uh, the first exposure, shall I say, to death of somebody, you know, dying. But uh, then we went to Lincoln Field, Lincoln, Nebraska, where a crew formed. Now, there were other bases in between for different training. But our crew was formed in Lincoln, Nebraska, and from Lincoln we were sent overseas, and we were replacement crews. What's a replacement crew? For a crew that didn't make it. And that's exactly how it was. And I was sent to Diefen Green, which was the field of the 452nd Bomb Group. At that time, did you, and obviously you knew they needed, the way they said it, the way they kind of stated it, is that they need more people into the Air Force. At that time in your mind, did you, any of you guys think the reason why they need them is because they're losing guys over there? No. So my, were, my dream was to be a P-38 pilot. Oh, there you go. Oh, so bad, so bad. And of course, it never materialized. Right. And thank God it didn't. I might not be here. Things always happen for a reason. Right. No, not until I got over did we really realize uh, how expendable crews were in the 8th Air Force. Uh, the saying in 43 and 44 was if you made six missions, you were living on borrowed time. Now, I didn't fly during that time. But then on the other hand, there were guys in our group that flew one mission or a half a mission and got shot down and were POWs for two, three years. I always felt I, uh, I was blessed. I flew, we were never wounded, nobody on our crew. We had holes in our plane Oh, I would guess about half the half of the missions, and uh, what I mean by holes, holes from flak, uh, German 88 millimeter cannons. That's what were shot at us. They could shoot up to about 25,000 feet. So we did not have a lot of fighter opposition as they did earlier, because the Germans were running out of pilots. The Germans were running out of fuel. Some of our targets were German airfields, so they couldn't get up. But our missions were twice as long. Towns like Berlin, Dresden, Munich. And flak is something you couldn't shoot back at. You could fly through it and hopefully make it. Kind of a feel of um, um, Dauphin Green, is that right? Dauphin? Dauphin, Dauphin. Dauphin Green, yeah. Dauphin, okay. Uh, that place. And can you tell me about when you showed up, um, it's in England, uh, if you got any reactions from the locals, you know, how they felt about you guys being there, and then um, the proximity from it to uh, possible bomb targets, you know, I mean, how distance-wise uh, was it, uh, how long was it, okay. that kind of thing. When we arrived uh, in England, I can remember on the train pulling into the station, little kids, and this is fact, you got any gum chum? That was one of the famous sayings. The English kids didn't know what gum was. They didn't know what Hershey bars were, things of that nature. But when I did get on the base, uh, we did not fly combat missions for probably four to six weeks. We did training missions over Scotland and Ireland. Now, we didn't drop any bombs. But we flew over Scotland and Ireland on a simulated mission. And the navigator did celestial navigation at night and things of that nature. But uh, the people of England back in 43, not when I arrived, but I understand really resented the Americans to a point. They said, 
the Yanks are over here, they're oversexed, and they're overpaid. And those were the sayings by the English, and it was kind of a joke. But then as they saw and became familiar with 8th Air Force members who went into the villages, into the pubs, and got to know the people, a closeness was formed. And then they loved and respected the Americans just as they did their own English people. But at the beginning, I have no idea really why, other than we were foreigners, that there was some resentment. Now, I myself did not participate that much in local uh, towns that were close by. Believe it or not, I did not drink. I did not smoke. I tried English beer, and I didn't like it, but I said I didn't drink. People asked me, what did you do during the war? And I said, I dropped bombs. And they said, what did you do when you got home? And I said, I got bombed. And uh, that's about the truth. I started then. But with our uh, base where we lived, we lived in these nascent huts, they called them. They were like Quonset huts, and they held two crews, usually. And we'd have a pot-bellied stove in the middle that had to be stoked with wood or what, or coal, to keep warm, because it was very damp and cold in England. It wasn't like some of the cities here, like Minneapolis, where it would get 10 or 20 below. But... It was cold and damp, and um, we would get up usually anywhere from 2 to 3 in the morning and uh, get dressed, of course. In my case, I don't remember hot water. Some guys say they do. I don't. It was cold water when you took a shower. Then we had breakfast. One thing being in the Air Force, you ate well. I can remember a lot of the cooks. It was cafeteria style where you'd go through a line with your tray, and many times the guy serving said, eat well, because this is probably your last meal. Ho, ho, ho. That kind of humor. But nevertheless, that's the way it was. After eating, we'd go to briefing. Briefing was in a room where we sat. A curtain came up, and there was the target for today. And on this map had ribbons going to the target. The ribbons never went direct. They'd go this way, that way, this way. Why? To throw the Germans off. After we dropped our bombs, we went straight home. There was no deviation. But uh, our missions lasted 8 to 10. I had one or two that lasted 12 hours. And now if you can imagine in a plane where it was 60 below outside and about 20 to 30 below inside, these were not pressurized planes. A lot of people have the misconception that the plane was pressurized like airplanes today. The first pressurized plane was the B-29 that was used in the Pacific Theater. But uh, it was cold. We did have electric flying suits that were used. And uh, as I mentioned to many, flying up in the nose, I did not needed that much because it was usually warm flying with that plexiglass nose with the sun coming in if you were flying it was kind of like sitting in a greenhouse but again if you were flying out of the sun then it might have been a little bit cooler as i said the missions were long half the time we were on oxygen and uh, if a guy's oxygen system got hit we had to, my, one of my responsibilities, I'll deviate for a moment, was to run an oxygen check every five minutes. And that was to see that everybody's oxygen was working. Because if their tanks would get hit, everybody had a different supply, they could be dead in about five minutes from anoxia. And that's brain dead. And so I'd have to run and I would unhug, unhug, unplug from the main oxygen line onto a portable bottle, and then I'd leave my position, keeping my oxygen mask on, of course. And then if you got to the position where this fellow was unconscious, you knew his oxygen system got hit, and hopefully you administered oxygen to him in, on time 
before he was dead. Now that did not happen on our crew, but it happened to many. If I can give you an example of that, a few years ago the famous golfer Payne Stewart was leaving Orlando for a golf tournament in uh, Dallas, Texas, and they got up to the panhandle and instead of turning west, the plane kept going. What had happened is they had a malfunction in the oxygen system and everybody on the plane died, but they were brain dead and I believe it went as far as North Dakota and then went straight down and crashed. But uh, that was more or less how we lived there. I got passes or received passes probably three, four times uh, while on combat missions and I went to London. I wanted to see history, meaning Buckingham Palace, St. Paul's Cathedral, Tower of London, Westminster Abbey. I remember going into a restaurant hearing about fish and chips and I ordered fish and chips. And the waitress came along and said, here's your fish and chips, Yank. And I said, those aren't chips, ma'am. Those are French fries. Oh, no, Governor. She said, those are chips. And that's what they were. But we thought fish and chips were something different, but they weren't. Uh, we didn't have much time. After a mission got done, we would have uh, interrogation. And uh, that was sometimes rough. What did you see? How many fighters? Da, 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 you know, this and that. And then uh, hopefully you could uh, clean up, have dinner. And then I would go to a place where the English ladies had uh, tea and little cookies and stuff, and they actually did, and uh, write mom and dad. And I probably wrote home just about every day. I was very homesick, very homesick. But uh, the most I ever flew, most missions I ever flew in a row were five. That may not sound like a lot, but when you get up at two or three and you get back at maybe four in the afternoon or five, it's a long day. And of course, somewhat traumatic also. Uh, my position, as I mentioned, I was known as a Tagalier, not a bombardier. The difference was I did not use the Norden bomb site. Late 44, the powers to be went from precision bombing to pattern bombing. Now what's the difference? Precision would be hitting a specific building, uh, target, not just the railroad yards, but possibly the station itself. And the powers to be went to pattern bombing, and that was where in every squadron we had a lead ship, meaning a lead aeroplane, with a bombardier. When he opened his bomb bay doors, the rest of us togliers would open ours. When his first bombs came out, we would drop ours. Now, we didn't always drop all the bombs at one time. We had a uh, instrument called, I believe, an intervalometer up in the nose where you could set it, say, to drop the bombs, hypothetically, two to three hundred feet apart, meaning they didn't want just to hit in one spot. And you'd see on a target or in a movie, boom, boom, boom. That is setting the bombs. And then the A2 releases, which they were called, in the bomb bay were electric, and the bombs never dropped from the top down, but from the bottom first. Because if the top hit first, they'd hit the ones below. So the ticks were the releasing of the bombs. If you had it, say, 400 feet apart, you'd hear a tick, then another tick, and then the next group would go, and another tick. Now and then, a bomb would get hung up, meaning stuck in the bomb bay. That happened to us twice. And the radio man uh, would get on intercom. I remember so well, and a radio to nose, one of the bombs stuck up, or got stuck. And I say, nose to radio, kick it out. That's all we could do. You couldn't leave it hanging, so you'd have to kick it out. We had two specific missions where we got lost. We could fly, probably, they said the ceiling, meaning how high you could fly in a B-17, 
was 35,000. I doubt it. We flew up to 30,000 once and uh, got lost in the clouds. Each bomb had cotter pins. A cotter pin, <coughs> pardon me, was attached to the fin in the bomb. And the cotter pins, once we got airborne, I would have to go back in the bomb bay, that was my responsibility, and pull the cotter pins out of the bombs. Now they were live. Now why didn't they want them to be live immediately? Because many times there were crashes on takeoff and the plane would explode. If the cotter pins were in, the bomb wasn't uh, alive. It wasn't, the fuses weren't out. So once we got airborne, I pulled the cotter pins. Okay, now when you drop the bombs, you heard that shh, you know, that's the fuse coming out counterclockwise. Now the bomb is alive, and when it hit, it would detonate. But two missions, I had to go back in the bomb bay at altitude with an oxygen mask on and put the cotter pins back in the bombs. And that was a little hairy, but that was to make sure the bombs were not live because when we landed it would be very dangerous and uh, that was about my responsibility uh, we would never see the bombs hit as you do in Hollywood in Hollywood you see the guy dropping the bombs and he looks out the window and watches them hit think about it if you're flying and you release the bombs your plane is way up here before your bombs hit but that was about how we dropped the bombs. You had the machine gun in the front of the, the nose there. Didn't yes, you? the chin turret is yeah. called. That was the last turret put on the B-17G, like in George. Uh, way back, the prototype, the first B-17, of course, I believe didn't have any, and then, of course, they added. And uh, example, they added two B uh, 50 calibers in the tail. Why? To discourage tail attacks. Then they had the ball turret underneath the plane. Why? To discourage underneath attacks. And then they added the chin turret up in the no uh, below the nose to discourage attacks from the front. Chin turret. This is where the two chin turret guns are. Then you had the ball turret which was underneath the belly and uh, that's where that was. You had the waist guns on either side. Some B-17s also carried a 50 caliber in the radio room in the ceiling. And then you also had two back here in the tail, as I mentioned. And of course, besides, the flight engineer fired these two up on the top. And then you had two more on the side of the nose. So you had 12 or 13 50 caliber machine guns. And I always said we always think of us, but think of a German fighter coming in on a group of 20 or 30 or 40 B-17s and each one having 12 and 13 50 caliber machine guns firing at them. I've read stories where they hated it. They, if they could get through it alive, they considered themselves very fortunate. We didn't fly fast. We flew. I asked children when I talk in schools, how fast do you think we flew? And they'll say, oh, two, three hundred miles an hour. They were born in the jet age. With a bomb load, we flew at about 155 miles an hour. And after the bombs were released and we headed home, we probably attained a speed of 190. The plane was not made for speed it was made for destruction. <laughs> I, I'm curious, bud. I mean, as far as like, I know the squadrons, you, you guys would be in a box of, of, of B-17s, and there'd be times when, um, you know, Mr. Schmidt, uh, Falkworth, whatever, would become flying through you guys, and you guys are firing from all directions. I mean, it's a fortress. Did you guys ever have concerns of, when you're hitting, hitting, one another. hitting one another? Absolutely. Now, as I mentioned previously, I don't want to take credit or whatever the word might be. We, on my 23 combat missions, had very little fighter attack 
by that time, the Germans were pretty well licked. But we did get attacked by the Jets, as I mentioned. But people have asked me many times, what stopped the ball turret gunner from shooting the props off his own plane, the propellers? There were cutoffs on the guns, meaning that once it was aimed towards the props and he hit the trigger, nothing would happen. Because in the heat of battle, nobody thinks of that. And uh, there were stories, though, and it was a good question, John, of where guys shot some of their other planes. I mean, the heat of battle, think of the nerves. And uh, uh, there are stories where a guy got out of formation, came over another, and there's a famous picture where a bomb went right through a wing of another plane below. And fortunately, uh, I guess they made it. But you had a as John said, fly in a more or less box. I, I kind of feel they must have learned that in a way from geese. If you've ever seen a flock of geese flying, and uh, but you'd hear the commander many times, the head guy saying, bring it in closer, bring it in closer. And meaning, of course, to discourage the fighters, because if you're spread too far apart, they could get in there. But... Uh, in, in war. war. First time that I really felt I was at war was not when I was drafted, not when I trained in all the camps, not when I flew practice missions, not when I got to England, not when I went on my first mission, but halfway through my first mission when flak started to come up. Then I knew somebody didn't like me. And it was that simple. I mean, think about it. How would you know you're at war if there's nothing bad happening? But all of a sudden, somebody's shooting at you or firing 88 millimeter cannons at you, and then you know you're at war and you want to fire back or do whatever you can for self-preservation. Very good. That's fine. Okay, now what? Flak. Flak itself. When I worked at Plains of Fame in Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, the uh, Eden Prairie was the suburb where Plains of Fame was. And how they got it there, I don't know. But they had an actual German 88 millimeter cannon there. And this is what the Germans would fire up at the 8th Air Force or the RAF, which was the Royal Air Force. And I was given to understand they could fire as high as 25,000 feet. Now the Germans, they could see though the flak hitting and if we were here and the flak was bursting and these are black puffs of smoke and they weren't close, it was a cat and mouse game. Then we would lower altitude and they'd be up here maybe. And then like this and that. Sometimes they were right on, meaning they would hit a plane direct. And if they hit a plane direct with a full load of bombs, you know what happened. They totally exploded. But Flak itself was an 88 millimeter cannon shell that burst into, hypothetically, 331 pieces, 410 pieces, 220, this size, that size. This is a piece of Flak that I dug out of our waste on one of our missions. However, if that would hit you right here, you would be bye-bye. If it had hit you here in the wrist, it would probably take your hand off. We had examples, many guys got hit in the legs, severed legs, severed arms, not on our crew. And when it happened, they'd put a tourniquet on them, put a parachute on them, and throw them out of the plane. Why? He'd bleed to death by the t time he got back home to England. Hopefully the Germans would pick him up and put him in a hospital. And they usually did. There was compassion there. But flak itself sometimes was very thick. You've heard the expression. You've seen it in movies. The flak was so thick today we could get out and walk on it. That was true. Sometimes it was very, very thick. What the Germans would do many times, 
they knew why, how they had spies just like everybody else. And they would move flak guns in overnight to a specific target. Example, Berlin was well fortified. I mean, there was flak constantly. On that mission, our lead navigator, for some reason, got fouled up and was not on the right run. And we went around the entire city of Berlin and had to do it a second time. And that's kind of living dangerously. But there was flak, flak, flak. And uh, if it had your name on it, I guess, that was it. But that's exactly, I had a kid one day say to me, in a school in Chaska, Minnesota, he came up afterwards and he said, Bud, I really enjoyed your talk, and especially flack. He said, now I know what it is. I thought it was what I used to get from my mom and dad. Kind of cute. That's what he said. That's what flack is. It was very, very uh, adventuresome. I believe that's one reason they wanted young kids. Two reasons, you're kind of gutsy. But anybody that tells you they weren't scared is a lousy liar. I was scared every time I went up. My grandmother, my dad's mother, gave me a little prayer book that I carried with me on every mission, and I used it. And guess what? I gave it to my son when he went to Vietnam, and he used it. But the missions themselves, our first mission, you're, you're kind of scared in a different way because this is all new. And we flew to Ham, Germany on that particular mission. Now, we had the number one and number two engines on the B-17 shot out. They were on fire, and they had to be feathered. A B-17 is not made to stay up on four engines. It, it, we were airworthy, but airworthy this way, not going down like that. The pilot ordered us to bail out, and I said, the one thing I'll never do, ever, is bail out. Guess who the first one was at the door with his parachute on? You betcha, me. But then, on every new crew, they put an experienced person, which made a lot of sense, because you're nervous, you don't really know. This happened to be the navigator, and he said to the pilot, how much fuel have we got? Where are the enemy lines? Because the enemy lines were changing daily. The Germans were retreating, 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 and they said they estimated it was the Rhine River. Well, Ham, Germany was pretty close to the Rhine River, and he countermanded or whatever, said, don't bail out, I think we can make it. And we were on this kind of a course, and we crashed in Belgium. And uh, we went to a schoolhouse for shot down crews. We stayed in Belgium, oh my goodness, for probably four to five days. Finally, a C-47, <coughs> pardon me, transport plane, came back and got us. And then, of course, we continued to fly. And a little side note, when guys went down and crews perished, you didn't mourn. There was no time for that. You would take their mattresses and roll them up, and they'd go through their foot locker. And then the powers-to-be would write the terrible letters back home. When we got back, the guy said, I remember this so well. Boy, are we glad to see you guys. And the first thing I said was, if you are, give me my clothes back. I'll never forget it. But a real side antidote to this, and it was like deja vu. When my wife and I went back to Diefen Green in 1984, we continued on on a tour of Europe, and we finally got to... We started the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy. It was wonderful. And then France. And we're sitting in a lounge. And these guys were asking me about the war. They knew I was in the war. And uh, about this first mission. And they said, where is St. Trone, Belgium? I said, I don't know. And they said, our bus driver, the tour guy, was from Belgium. So we called over and said, Albert, where is St. Trone, Belgium? 
And Albert said, why? And he came over with his beer in hand. And I told him that's where I got shot down. And Albert, all of a sudden, tears formed in his eyes. And I told him what had happened, how we were picked up by a truck that took shot down crews to a schoolhouse. He said, Bud, that is where I'm from. And that's what my father did. My father could have been the one that picked you up. You talk about a funny feeling that went through my gut. The next morning when we got on the bus, he handed me a map of Belgium with St. Troyden circled and said, this is for my liberator. I'll never forget it to the day I die. But uh, that was a very hairy one. Uh, we went to Berlin, as I mentioned, on our 13th mission. I'm not superstitious. But yet, I always took my flak suit and I never wore it. I wrapped it around my feet because I always felt my feet were going to get hit. We all have kind of little superstitions. But on the way back from Berlin, we dropped down real low to about 200 feet from 25,000 feet because the turbulence is very smooth at that level. And you get careless just like you do in your car when you do, don't put on your safety belt. Guys were lounging, they're going home. One B-17 came out of formation and came down on top of this one. This one chewed the nose off of this one. The navigator and the bombardier both perished. They drowned. The props from this one cut this plane right in half because a plane is just made of aluminum and they all died. But the one who had the nose cut off, he made it back uh, safely, uh, minus the bombardier and navigator. And when we got back, we were all kind of like shaken and they sent us to a rest home for about three days, uh, justifiably so, because it was kind of hairy. There were other... Uh, traumatic things that happened uh, when we were attacked by the ME-262 jets. These were German jets. Germany was so far ahead of America, scientifically. Our jets were on blueprints. We were just working on them. They had jets, but Hermann Goering said to Hitler to use those jets to take England when they had France totally but Hitler, in his stupid-ass wisdom, excuse me, said, no, we're going to Russia. And thank God he did, because, you know, history what happened. But the jet itself, they came up and attacked us on a mission to Dresden. Actually, it was called Svika, which was a suburb of Dresden. And uh, they got the lead ship. His tail blew off. I saw it from the nose. He was still, still able to stay airworthy. The plane on our right wing, I couldn't see it, but our waist gunner was calling it off over intercom, and I think that's even worse when you can't see it. They're on fire. Get out of there. They're on fire. Oh, my God, they exploded. And uh, you're hearing it, and it, it, it's even worse. But that was a traumatic mission. Others were, some of them were called milk runs. Milk run meaning very no problems. We hopefully hit the target. We had some flak, but none of it hit our plane. But uh, those were in the minority. Find it. There's a, a little there. That log. That's my log. No, not just this. Yeah. This is my actual log. From the war. Yeah. That's it. Wow. I kept this, and uh, am I on now? No. Yeah. Oh. I kept this and every mission and uh, most of the guys said, what in the heck are you doing that for? I said, I want to bring it home, show it to my mom and dad. And I remember our flight engineer saying, why? We're not going to make it. Uh, guys were very, uh, I can't think of the word, uh, fanatical or, uh, no, that isn't the right word. Just uh, pretty much written themselves off. Here. Swicka, Germany, the rural in Germany, March 19th, 1945. We hit a secondary target that day, meaning the, uh, the initial target was either 100% overcast and you couldn't see it. 
there was always a second choice because you didn't want to go back with the bombs on the plane, that's why. Uh, sometimes there wasn't a second choice or they couldn't hit it and they would just dump the bombs, which is terrible. Anyway, very light flak, P-51 Escort. We were attacked by the ME-262 jet. The lead ship was hit bad, plus a few others. One blew up, and the one that blew up was on our right wing, as I mentioned. Uh, we landed in Brussels for gas, and uh, this was not when we were shot down. This was number 14, because twice. We landed in Brussels once, and we landed in Paris once for gas. But there were a lot of guys that said, we can make it, and they'd see the White Cliffs of Dover, and they didn't make it, they'd go into the drink. The North. That's why we carried the May West. There's a lot of B-17s on the bottom of the English Channel. Uh, anyway, uh, that, uh, the jets themselves, as I mentioned, uh, if Hitler would have listened more to Hermann Goering, who was head of the Air Force, the war would have lasted longer. They wouldn't have won, no way, but the war could have lasted. If it wouldn't have been for the B-17, and I better add the B-24 for my prejudiced B-24 buddies, America, if it wouldn't have been for them, the war probably would have lasted another year at least. Everybody said that because Germany was totally leveled. And that's not nice, but it's the truth. And I met a guy one day talking about the World Trade Center and how terrible it was, which it was. And I said to him, well, can you comprehend or even imagine all of New York looking like that? And he looked at me, he said, are you nuts? I said, that's how Berlin looked. That's how Frankfurt looked. I mean, uh, the Japanese were very, very stubborn to surrender, as everybody knows. The Germans were too, but not to the same extent. As we all know in history, Hitler committed suicide and so forth. But that's what the jet was. I can't tell you much more about it. Prince. Yeah. Okay, well, when we were attacked, uh, these planes went by, and this is all I can really remember, and it's gospel. They went by like that. And we, what was that, more or less? And I hit the toggle switch. All of our turrets were electric turrets. We were even pretty well advanced in those days. America's, anything America made was good. But I had the chin turret, and it was stowed, in this position and the plane came on that side so I hit the switch and it more or less moved at this speed and by the time it got around over here I joked and said that jet was down in his mess hall having lunch we didn't even get a chance to fire at him but I do under I've been told this at least they could not stay up very long they could make one or maybe two passes meaning uh, at a t target and they had to land. Not like jets today that can stay up a long time. You said how they kind of stowed themselves kind of... Oh yes, they did, underneath the P-51s. They came in from behind, and a P-51 Mustang, which was an American fighter, and if it had wing tanks, and if you saw a picture of that, and then saw a picture of the ME-262 with the jet engines, they looked similar and they stalled right underneath the P-51s. And the P-51s, of course, they can't look down below. And then they made their attack. It was sneaky, but that's war. You know, getting off that B-17, and you knew it was over, and you didn't have to do it again. Um, how did you feel about what you had done, and what it... I uh, had no real any conscience at all for what I had done, probably at that moment, more so, I was so relieved that I was going to make it home. Now, I never felt, never, that I wasn't going to make it home. I always, always, and I'm not saying I, uh, I wasn't negative, that's for sure, but I was positive I was going to make it home. My last mission was Karlsbad, Germany, 
on April 19th, 1945. Now, how come mine was April 19th? I always felt bad for the guy that flew on April 30th and got killed because VE Day was May 8th. How sad. But ours was we uh, hit marshalling yards, which were railroad yards, and uh, didn't have any flak. We had P-51 Escort. We had bandits in the area. Bandits are Messerschmitts, but they didn't hit our group. But uh, And then, of course, after that, I flew the uh, Mercy missions to Holland on May 1st, May 2nd, there were five, and May 3rd. And that is when, if I can, would be like uh, you and I fighting, Matt, and uh, you beat me up, and you're walking away, and I pick up a rock and throw it at you. The Germans knew the war was over. They were in the Netherlands, occupied. They knew it was over. They knew surrender was coming in a few days. What did they do? They blew up the dikes in Holland. Amsterdam and The Hague particularly totally flooded them. People were dying at 5,000 a week, starving. And to stay alive, the people in Holland, this is gospel, were eating tulip bulbs. And we, Eisenhower and Churchill, negotiated with the Germans. If we could come over, remember the war is still on, and with B-17s and Lancaster British bombers, we put plywood floors in the bomb bay and loaded it with K-rations. We called it Chowhound missions, and the English called it manna, biblical manna from heaven. And I can, instead of flying at uh, 25,000, can you imagine B-17s coming in at two to 300 feet? I saw cows, not steers, milk cows stampede, and I swear they had to have curdled milk for a week. I mean, it, and the people waved, and it was a beautiful way, for me at least, to end the war. I was doing something good. And the people of Holland had written on the rooftops with sheets and flowers, God bless you boys. I always remember telling my dad that. Um, it was just after destruction. My older son, who's in his 60s today, I was putting him to bed one night. He was about probably five. Had him up on the toilet seat and washing his face, getting him ready for bed. And he looked at me and said, Daddy, how many people did you kill during the war? And that's what he said, because he knew what I had done. And I said, Mike, I don't know, and don't you ever ask me that question again. That was probably... One of the nicest things about flying, you didn't see the blood and guts. I have no idea, I have no idea how many people, probably hundreds, that were killed. But again, that's war, and you can't do anything about it. But uh, we can come back, if that's all right. We're actually... Uh, yeah, if you could tell me about the B-17. Well, the B-17, and also, as I mentioned previously, I speak in schools to uh, usually junior high and high school. Uh, smaller than that, it, <coughs> pardon me, gets a little traumatic, you know, for kids. But if I may, a few of the things that I talk about when I'm in the school is I tell kids, of course, that I'm not here to glorify war at all, but more so to talk about the price of war and what was paid, meaning between 28 and 29,000 young men in the 8th Air Force lost their lives. And that means guys 19, 21, 22, 23 didn't get to be husbands, didn't get to be fathers, and surely didn't get to be grandpas. And that's pretty sad. But uh, I flew across the English Channel 26 times, up and back. The B-17 itself, there were 12,741 manufactured by America. 12,741. 
and over 5,000 were shot down. Now that's about a 40% casualty rate, which is pretty high. The fuel capacity, as I mentioned earlier, was 2,400 to 2,800 gallons of gas per plane, and we would burn somewhere in the area of 50 gallons per engine. So 50 times 4, 200 gallons per hour. The B-17 itself carried four, one, two, three, four, Wright Cyclone 1200 horsepower engines. And our airspeed was about 155 miles an hour with a bomb load. And after we dropped the bombs, probably 190 or so. Again, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't made for speed. It was made for destruction. The bomb loads we carried, we carried 100 pounders, 250, 500, or 1,000. We never mix them. Meaning, as I tell kids, or ask kids, if today's mission were 40 100-pound bombs, and tomorrow we had to carry the same equivalent weight in 1,000 pounders, how many would we carry? And some kid puts his hand up and says four. And then I tell the teacher, give him an A. And that's about it, though. Uh, the bomb loads themselves were, oh, six to 8,000 pounds that we could carry. Now, the B-24 Liberator was a larger plane, could carry more bombs, a heavier bomb load, but it couldn't take the punishment. And you get a B-24 guy, and a B-17 guy together is like Ford and Chevrolet. But that's the way it is. Anyway, that's just a little bit about the B-17 itself. Uh, do you want me to tell you a little bit about the equipment? The equipment that we had, and I'm fortunate enough that I have most of it. When the war ended, security stopped more or less. And I came into the train station in Chicago always remember Union Station, it's still there. Call Pop, told my dad I was home. You're home. I said, well, not yet. I got to get discharged from my 30-day furlough. But come down to the station with some brown paper bags, and that is the truth. Very few people have this because we had to turn everything in. I got off of the train, waited for my dad, took all my stuff and put it in brown paper bags, and he took it home. And when I got to, and I know I'm going to get sent to prison, and when I got to Fort Sheridan and we were going through the line to turn stuff in, and they asked me where mine was, I said, I left it all in England. Anyway, this is called the May West. Now, the, why do we have this? We flew in England. We're not flying in the Pacific because we flew over the English Channel. And the English Channel is water, or the North Sea. Many B-17s went down because they thought they could make it home and they didn't have enough fuel. Okay, then of course we have our famous helmet, if I can find it, and here it is. Now believe it or not, they did give us good stuff. This is leather, and this leather is only, what, 68, nearly 70 years old? It still is pliable and beautiful. Earphones, this is how we talked. This plugged in, or how we communicated. And then the other side of it was, how did I respond? And that is with a throat mic. This is known as a throat mic. And what it did is it went around your neck and went on your Adam's apples. And as I spoke, I would say nose to tail tail to nose or whatever, and they could communicate back. That's why, as I mentioned earlier, you had to be sure not only the oxygen system, but the communication was not knocked out. Besides this, of course, in the air we had goggles that went over the helmet because up at 25,000 feet, the sun is really, really bright. And there are different lenses that I have in the case for the type of weather that you flew in that particular day. Then we also had the most important thing, if I may, I'm just throwing this down, 
and that is this, and this is the one that the children in school laugh at the most, and that is my oxygen mask. And I think I look like an elephant, but I told them, don't laugh at this. This was my insurance policy. If you didn't have this, you died. We put these on around 12,000. You were supposed to feet. You were supposed to put them on somewhere in the area of 10,000. When you get to 18,000 feet in the air, there is no more oxygen. So you better have this. And then, as I mentioned, we were on this probably half the time. When I was up at altitude from perspiration and sweat, ice would form here. So you take a deep breath and go like this to knock the ice out, and then you put your mask back on. That's living dangerously to a point. We also had a thing called an escape kit. Think about it. How much could they give you at 25,000, 30,000 feet? It'd be nice to give you a suitcase, but they couldn't. We couldn't carry machine guns on the plane we did, but if we bailed out, we had trusty 45 pistols. And I always kind of laughed. I never had it happen because I never bailed out. But seeing a guy bail out with a 45 and down on the ground are six Germans with submachine guns. I mean, don't make sense. But this escape kit carried bullion cubes, Halazon tablets for water purification, an escape map in case you weren't picked up, and the underground was very helpful during the war in helping a number of flyers get out. They went through Sweden, through different places. In this escape map, besides that, were matches. They're still in here. I don't know if they work. And as I mentioned earlier, a piece of flak that I dug out of the waste, and all that is is a piece of German 88 millimeter shell. But uh, this is the equipment that I had. The one thing uh, we had is electric flying suits. I don't have that full suit. And uh, flak suits and helmets. A good friend of mine happens to have those, but I don't have them.